and we're amazing creatures. You know, like if I'm thinking for five hours, it doesn't mean I need to stop thinking for five hours. If we just give our brain a rest for five to 10 minutes, it's it's incredible what it gives it the opportunity to do. So just look, how do you switch off? This is my conversation with Matt Elliott. Matt's a former professional rugby league player, head coach in Australia, New Zealand and the UK and of the USA national team. He's the owner and founder of The Change Room, a well-being business. He's also authored a book by the same name. A core practice of leadership is the actions we choose to perform every day to lead ourselves. A balanced approach across your physical, mental, emotional, community and spiritual actions contributes to leading yourself well. Physical is what we do. Mental is what we think. Emotional is how we feel. Community is how we interact with people. And spiritual is how we maintain our inner self. Matt shares details around these five action areas along with simple suggestions to help leaders take action. Without balance across these areas, it's impossible to sustain high performance. Matt's pint glasses for Arsa's story at the end of the interview reinforces his message of balance. Check out my three key takeaways after the interview. We love feedback. Let us know what you liked or didn't like, and we'll keep improving. This is the Cultural Things Podcast. I'm Brendan Rogers. Sit back and enjoy my conversation with Matt. So Matt, why is it important to be able to lead yourself? That's a great question, Brendan. And I think the thing that we need to establish first is, is that if you can't lead yourself, <laughs> how are you going to lead other people? As one of my great mentors, Wayne Dyer, God rest his soul, um, said, if you want to sell orange juice, you need oranges. You can't give away what you don't have. And I think that's one of the key things that we're experiencing in modern life. We tend to be experts in what we do, the places we go, the things that we enjoy, but how much expertise do we have in ourselves? Now, I see you walking down the street. How you going, mate? Oh, why? What have you been up to? How often do you ask yourself that question? How much expertise and awareness, self-awareness are we, you know, are we developing in ourselves so that we can then be in a position to, to inspire others or to help people in a direction that they want to go? Mate, you have spent a lot of time in change rooms around the world. You've got a business called The Change Room. You've written a book called The Change Room. Yep. Why did you start a business and write a book? Yeah, again, I guess it's the metaphor that it brings. First of all, you know, I've, I've kind of worked out my purpose in life is to help people find a better way. And you can't get better without changing. You can't stay the same and get better, right? Uh, so that was the first one. And the other metaphor about change rooms, and as you say, Brennan, I spent a lot of time in them, is there a place of transformation? So as a, the, the really poor joke I always tell is, is that a, you know, a footy player can't walk down the aisle of Woolworths and dip their shoulders into someone in the fruit and veggie section, right? But equally, you know, I love Peter Garrett and he doesn't walk down the street, you know, going like that, does he? They go into change rooms and there's a, you know, there's a transformation between them being a normal person to being a performer. They don't just change their clothes. They change who they are. And a lot of us need to do that. You know, it, you know in, in life, we're going to encounter challenges. We're going to go through adversity. And they're little signals for us to change. And unless we can find our change room to transform ourselves into who we want to be rather than who we, you know, who we are, then we get stuck. And being stuck has you know, stuck emotionally, mentally, or physically has real consequences for us. Hmm. When did you find your purpose, mate? When did you settle on this purpose of yours? Um, look, my whole life's been a life by accident, Brendan. I wish I could say I sat out and intended to do this, but, you know, quite in a quite, you know, synchronistic way, I, you know, my my father was my footy coach, but he also introduced, I was born on Thursday only, he introduced basketball and rugby league up there. And my mum at that time was, a, when we first moved to Townsville, was a matron 
at what was called a crippled children's home in those days. It's not the terminology that you could use now, definitely. Um, and I guess in doing that, I used to go there every afternoon because her shift finished at five and my school was close by. I, I guess I, I worked out that, you know, helping people enjoy life and is, is something that I was just born to do. Uh, I was brought up in a family that all did that. And then I, I became a youth worker in Sydney when I graduated from university and and then going into football and then going into coaching. It was all just, you know, slight manipulations of, of again, trying to find a better way for people to exist. And so, yeah, I sort of had to sit down and not, and not the too distant past and go, what is it I really want to do? And I worked out, well, you've kind of been doing it your whole life, mate. So just sort of perfected and, and narrow your focus just a tad. Mate, I have to ask, in the rugby league context, are you a maroon or are you a blue? No, there's, mate, I was born in Queensland. I'm a real Queenslander, mate. We're not, I'm not just a Queenslander like people from Brisbane. You know, I'm a North Queenslander. We're, we're well away from the border. So, and that, and that's kind of made it fun. I've probably spent more, no, not probably, I have spent more of my life living in New South Wales, but my state of origin is Queensland. Glad to hear it, mate. We can continue it. How good was it being in New South Wales when we won those 10 in a row? <laughs> that was tough. I got four daughters and they were all born in New South Wales. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been, been a lot of fun. <laughs> Not so much fun when we haven't won a couple of times in recent years, but, again, I'm walking around with a smile again. Absolutely, mate. But uh, as they say, be humble or be humbled, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a balancing act, that one. It certainly is, mate. It certainly is. Um, back to the serious stuff. So again, that analogy around the change room and in that professional context, very clear. Um, what is that? What do people need to do in order to want to step into that change room of life? Well, you're in it anyway. You know what I mean? We're all living life, so why not find a better way of doing it? You know, we're all, and, you know, it's whatever your philosophical approach or, or, or spiritual background is or whatever it is, is that they all tend to align to the fact that we're here to enjoy this experience. We're not here to just to survive. Um, hence, why would we have consciousness if, if we did? So um, I, I think that my belief in it is, is that there's an opportunity for us every day to be a little better in what we're doing. It doesn't mean that we, we're going to do that, but what in life of significance is easy, right? So it's it's just just about finding opportunities and ways of if you can't enjoy life, find a way to be a little bit better until you can enjoy it. Yeah, mate, it's a great point, and I, I never in reading your book and, and finish it, I never really considered that just everyone is there actually. But I guess more to the point. What stops people in your vast experience taking on that improvement challenging challenge of of bettering themselves, being deliberate about bettering themselves? There's a few things that contribute to that, but I guess the easiest way is we quite often, you know, we, we've got a choice between, you know, health or convenience. So if I use it's easier, you know, I always use it's easier to sit on the lounge and watch TV than it is to exercise, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's easier to go through Macca's drive through than it is to cook a healthy home-cooked meal, yeah? And what we tend to do is we choose that convenience over health. And in modern life, it's it's prevalent. You know, there was a time way, way, way back when we didn't have the opportunity to make that choice. You know, so we had to – but what we're seeing was a lot of the health issues that people are experiencing in modern life. And I, no, I'm not saying that modern life's bad. I'm just saying that – People are choosing convenience over health way too often, and there's a consequence to that. We all know it. It's not – no one can avoid it. <laughs> no one can avoid it. So I think that's probably the biggest impactor on on the choices that we make. But there's also another thing called purpose, and we've already kind of discussed that. And we're so conditioned into, look, for you to achieve, you have to you know, educate yourself to this level. You have to be this type of person. And the more that we start to investigate that, the more we see that there's flaws in that 
that approach to life. I, not not completely flawed because learning's a great thing, right? But uh, I guess the people that are the highest achievers on the planet tend to sort of sit outside the normal realm of education. I'd say. Mm. Yeah, it's they a- tend to be purpose driven. Yeah, and again, I I won't. I'll refrain from unpacking the purpose and purpose driven too much at the moment. We have touched on it, but done a actually a very recent podcast specifically around purpose. So people can go back and refer to Alex's Alex Lee's episode on that. But let's let's move into the four foundations of life and what I'd say about leading yourself. Can you just give again that they're really entrenched in the book, a key part of the book, obviously. What are the four foundations of life that you refer to in the book? Just a bit of an overview and we'd like to unpack those in a bit more detail. Yeah, look, the whole reason behind that first, Brendan, is to give people access to a high-performance approach, which is a really trick way of saying human performance. Mm. Trust me, if something works for an athlete to make them better, it'll work for us, okay, whether it be in their physical approach, that's foundation number one, their mental approach, what you think, your emotional approach, how you feel, or your ability to connect to other people, human connection, which we call community, right? There, are, there is another one that can fast track you, but that tends to scare people off when we start talking about energy or spirit. And I, while I don't not not believe in that, what I'm saying is, is that it, you know, our modern language of engagement is science and around physical, mental, emotional, and and human connection, there is actual proof that we can make ourselves better. As I say, there is a shortcut and some people who are you know, deeply you know, religious or spiritual can take those shortcuts, but it seems to be in modern life that we need other, other confirmation and science certainly mm-hmm. helps us out in that area. It's almost like we have a bias as a, as a human species. We've got to be able to sort of touch, feel and measure it to some extent. Otherwise, you know, how can it be real or, or useful? Yeah, you know what? I, I, I sat with a pretty smart guy called Deepak Chopra one time and I didn't really, I was a, you know, an atheist at the time and I didn't really understand what he was on about. And he pointed up to the TV beside me and I think it was Channel 9 was on. And he said, what channel is that? And I said, yeah, Channel 9. And he said, so if I smash that TV to bits, will the signal still be there? And I went, yeah. And he said, well, that's that's how I would explain what you are, is, is that your body is the, the TV, but there's a signal inside it that's been with you your whole life. It's not your memory, but it's, it's a signal. So, you know, while I can embrace that now and I understand that, that we still there's there's a progression from where I was to where I wanted to get to, and a lot of that was in the, you know, the the, the physical realm that I just spoke about, physical, mental, emotional, and obviously our ability to connect to other people. Where because we're a community based species. Mm. And if we talk about these four, and actually I'll add the five, the spiritual, just into the bucket for this question: Can you be high performing sports person, coach, leader, whatever terminology you want to use, without a foundation of these four or five things? Not for a sustained period. No, you can't be. You can get some results. And you know, what we've learnt, you know, and what everyone now understands in life, it's about balance. So the short answer is no, you can't. You can't become a, a high achiever. You can't even become the person you want to be without having balance of that in your life. You know, or just to expand on that slightly, like stress gets a bad, bum rap, doesn't it? stress and pressure, Mm. they get a really bum rap. But you know what exercise is? You know what it does? It stresses your body. But if you get the balance between loading your body and recovering your body right, you grow physically. It's the same with mentally. You know, learning new stuff can be quite overwhelming, can't it? Absolutely. But if you get the the balance of going away, that – that learning then turns into knowledge. You can't you can't learn new stuff without actually overwhelming yourself, and that's the same emotionally. And it's the same match also with our connection with people. Is is unless we can we can share adversity or challenge together, you know, we're not bonded. <laughs> we don't have that connection. So it cuts across all of them. Is mm-hmm. is that we need to be challenged in life to grow. Let's unpack physical the the what we do 
Tell us a bit about physical and then we'll get into maybe some practical examples of people. Let's say people who are you know, listening to this podcast potentially are probably you know, up and coming leaders or they've been in a leadership role for a, a short period of time. There are certainly some that you know, are more experienced, but we'll unpack that and maybe what people can do to start their journey in that physical capacity to start to better themselves. Yeah, look, I think the thing here, Brendan, is we all need to recognize that when I speak about these things in the physical realm, you're already doing them. I presume right now you're breathing. I hope you are. I'm doing um, my best. <laughs> you know, you will, you'll eat at some stage today. You will have slept, you know, hopefully really well over the last little while. You know, we're moving. I'll be, you know, I was told not to move too much by Mark. So, so sorry, mate, I'll, I'll, I'll keep still. But you're doing that, okay? You're doing all these things. So there's just a, there's a way of doing it slightly better. So if I taught you how to breathe slightly better, for example, okay, it will put you, because if I go, <laughs> there's a signal that goes to my brain that there's something bad going on, okay? You know that. You'll pass out. I always have to give the bad news first because it gets people's attention. Is that right, though? If you hyperventilated, eventually there'll be a signal that goes up through your vagus nerves to your brain going, dude, you need to, you need to just stop for a bit mm. and you'll pass out. Mm. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Equally, if you learn to, to breathe deeply and diaphragmically, there's a signal that goes to your brain that goes, man, everything's okay. You can relax. So by learning to do that as a practice, not 24-7, but to do that as a practice, it, it just allows you that balance, that recovery that we spoke about. So there's just little ways to do things better. You know, you're going to eat. So why not? Why not eat in a way that's going to serve you rather than deteriorate your physical well-being, which so many of us make the choice of? And you can't get it right 100% of the time. Again, but if you can get it right most of the time or in your own home when you're eating at home, that's what a great start that is. You know, movement. We are designed to move. We have a thing called our lymphatic system. It's, a, it's another circuitry system in our body where our immune system is located it actually functions on how we move, okay? And if you don't move, you'll be unhealthy. That's simple. You don't, this is not exercise. Movement and exercise are different things. Mm -hmm. I'm moving now. I'm not exercising, right? If I was exercising, I'd be doing something different. Mm -hmm. Exercising is great, by the way, because, again, it, it accelerates the loading of our body. As long as we get our recovery right, we can then – again, spike hormones in our body that are super healthy for us. So, yeah, it's about just doing all those things that we're already doing just a little bit better. So let's take breathing. Something so simple, although done properly, maybe requires a little bit more deliberacy to start with. How can something so simple be so effective and powerful? <laughs> well, again, if I just get you to pinch your nose and stop breathing, it's pretty powerful, right? <laughs> You know, point, and I get their point. <laughs> and I work with a guy who's, you know, you know, work. I met him through Mick Fanning, a guy called Nam Ball. When he's worked with you know, the Blues, sorry, Nam. You know, he's worked with the Roosters and Richmond and a whole lot of high You know, uh, Jess Fox, um, and he teaches you that one. It's not just the level of oxygen in your body, but the signals that are sent through your body when you breathe well. Mm. And it's not a difficult thing. But again, if you can elevate the level of oxygen in your body and, and get the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide right in your body, you have clarity of thought. You're able to relax. But also, if I'm going into a thing where I'm going to compete at a high level, I can stimulate myself through breathing because I understand how it serves me. So you're doing it. But if you just get a better – and there was a time where intuitively, way, way back in the past – you would have understood that. Okay, I need to breathe deeply here because I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm just about to go into a situation that's going to be, be challenging, and that's again. You see, other species do it. We've just forgotten how to do it because we've been programmed out of it. But by breathing well, it'll give you access to better sleep. And if you, you know, we, we're separating all these things out right at the moment. But if I sleep better, I'm probably going to wake up with better mental clarity which means I might make some better decisions about what I eat 
or how I move. Does that make sense? I have more energy. So while while we like to separate things in modern life, they're all connected, but breathing is central to it, most definitely very central to, again, the quality of health and, and the the reactions, the chemical reactions and hormonal responses that are going on in our body, but also how we can stimulate ourselves, but also wind ourselves down. Sleep, very, very underrated as well. Mm. I just want to follow on from what you said about these things that connect in it and it comes through the book, obviously, but what's, is there one out of the, the four to five that is the one that is the most leverage into the others? Again, great question. And there's a yes and a no answer to that. So what I would say is is that... It depends. (laughs) (laughs) What I would say is this, is is that if you look at frequency, we have about 24,000 breaths a day. Um, The science that I've read around thought processes, we have about 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day but we're in an emotional state 24 Mm seven. Even when, you know, I went and got a knee replacement recently and I was under general anesthetic, apparently even under general anesthetic, you know, I'm in an emotional state. And we tend to find that our emotions are the biggest driver of our behaviors. And it's because if you go way, way, way back when we were born, our reptilian brain, which sits in the middle of our, just above our, our brainstem that goes up there and our cortex grows, it's fully developed. Mm. So when you're a baby and you're hungry, how do you communicate that? You cry. So you, you, we initially communicate through emotions. When you're happy, you laugh. But now, you know, and then what we've done with our cortex, which is amazing, which has made us, you know, you know, an amazing species, the way that we've grown it about, particularly our prefrontal cortex, is we then we can articulate that as language. I'm feeling this way for this reason. Uh, well, we forgot to do that a lot in modern life. So when someone feels anxious, we're told to suck it up and have a cup of concrete and we, we get rid of that, don't we? And so that just that get, gets compartmentalised in us and it, again, manifests in a, in a different way, which I'm sure we'll speak about later. So... That was my long way of saying emotions probably have the biggest impact on our behaviour. Mm. But they're not, again, our emotional state isn't separate from how we think. It isn't separate from how we, you know, our physical state, nor is it, you know, separate from how we connect with people either. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just go back to sleep. One of the common things maybe you hear, I know I hear a lot is, you know, I've had a terrible night's sleep or, you know, how are you feeling today? I, yeah, all right, but I slept pretty ordinary. What helps people have a better night's sleep? Yeah, again, what we've all got to recognise this is genetically we're not that different to what we were a few thousand years back. Now, even when I was a kid, there was no phones, right? Mm. <laughs> um, me too. You know, I was told- me too. No phones for me. <laughs> And the tell and the telly stopped at ten o'clock at night when I was a kid. Um, so what we're not doing, first of all, is what you know. In the morning, we get up, and if we get sunlight on our face, the thing that helps us sleep, melatonin, is is produced in our body from sunlight in the morning, particularly before ten o'clock. So one of the things that we do know is that if you get ten minutes of direct sunlight, and that doesn't mean sun on your face it means it can even come through clouds on your face okay your melatonin levels go up that's the thing that helps you sleep at night that's the first thing so doing that in the morning would be really good for you and so would be some movement during the day but the other thing that we used to do was we used to wind down at night but people are still looking at their phones and there's blue light going into there so we're stimulating ourselves and then go i can't get to sleep i can't understand why so the one of the Big things is certainly breathing that allows you to relax, breathing deeply and diaphragmically, you know, at night, but also just starting to maybe turn some lights off. Maybe, you know, there's blue light blockers now that you can put on your, you know, all your technology. That's a good idea, but just starting to wind down at night. 
we tend to we tend not to do that as much mm-hmm. these days, and that impacts our sleep. So, and that again, there's a hormonal ba- thing that happens to us that keeps us stimulated because we're telling our body it's daylight. And you know, if we do that on a consistent basis, how we get in the habit, this routine of not sleeping well. Mm. Matt, out of the three you've spoken about in relation to physical, so sleep, eat, and breathe, almost forgot the most important one. <laughs> Which one of those would you, again, people starting on a journey of being more deliberate about their physical health and those three aspects, which one of those would you suggest they start with and what would they do? Yeah, look, and you always got to tread softly around this, but what what we put in our body and what we eat at the moment, there's a lot of things when I was a kid that I was told were unhealthy, all right, like fats. Fat doesn't make you fat. Okay, and we were told the most important meal of the day was breakfast. And a lot of our breakfast meals are, you know, there's sugar is not a food. It's a substance and it's the most addictive substance on the planet. Okay, it's Mm. not a food. You need to understand that. There's no nutrient value in it for us. And but it's great, isn't it? You know, yes. And and I'm not saying don't take it because I can't because I'd be a hypocrite because, mm. you know, I've got a sweet tooth and, you know, I had, had my little bit of ice cream last night <laughs> and I would love to say it was organic and, you know. A man and, after my own heart, ice cream, mate. I've got a weakness of that. <laughs> yeah, but, so I'm not saying you don't do this, but I'm just saying is that you need to limit that stuff. You know, vegetable oils and, you know, one of the things that, you know, glyphosate, which, you know, Roundup, which is on our food, a lot of our food is you know, these things are, you know, massive causes of of illness on the planet. And it, I, it's, it's unfortunate that I've got to get your attention through telling you what's bad again. Mm-hmm. But that this is, I'm not making this up. This this is the truth in life. And, you know, I, I love the quote where, you know, what was it that, People ask why organic food is so expensive. Well, maybe we should be asking why is food that we buy in supermarkets so cheap? Um, mm. And, you know, it's th- this thing that we, we live in. You know, I'm, I'm in a house and it's great to be in a nice house. Yeah, that's great, but this is what we live in. And, you know, the the, the body that we live in, we, we need to make sure that from what we put into our mouth is – is going to help help that, and if you don't do it, and we see it, your eyes work right. You know, we see it on daily on a daily basis that that people aren't physically in a state where they need to be, and you know, carrying weight or being obese is not how we're meant to be. That is not normal. Um, and while we we have to be delicate around this. Because you know, we, I'm certainly not into shaming people about it. While we have to be delicate around it, you need to understand that that's not how the human species is meant to be. So we, you need to be very conscious about what you put in your mouth if you if you're committed to being healthy. Mm. One of the the absolute key thing I found about your book, the Change Room, is the practicality of the things that you talk about and suggest in there. I found it a bit astonishing actually that it's number one in the psychology leadership thing when I didn't take any perspective of psych well, I did on the psychology, but it's not like a typical psychology book where you're trying to look up the definition of words and stuff. It was so practical. There's a number of recipes. Oh sorry, you were gonna say something. No, look this the I, I wrote the book originally, it was about that thick when I originally wrote it. It was just full of information. I read mm. and it was ready to publish and I, they said, Can you read it again? And I read it. I said, no, there's no way I can put this out. And, and and the reason being is is that we all have different abilities in life. And my, my ability is to process knowledge and make it accessible to people. My ability isn't to come up with the knowledge. So all that stuff that I just shared with you, for example, isn't mine. I didn't do the research behind it. But so much of it is inaccessible to the everyday person. Mm. And that was my commitment 
in doing that it was to make it practical so that okay you're saying all this stuff and we've got to do all this so how does that look how, how can I do that and once you get that momentum going and doing it then you start to feel at ease and then people then start to look deeper into it so that for example the you know the easy menus and the and the cooking side of things that's just to give momentum it's not to create a whole lifestyle around mm. what's your favorite recipe in the book oh again i've got that sweet tooth so uh, you know I, the desserts. yeah the, go to the desserts in it i'm i'm into at the moment making desserts with um a, a coconut cream and um organic berries and just putting it in the blender and oh so that that works really well for me just yeah, you know, with a little bit of you know throw the odd banana in there and stuff like that so i i'm i'm a big experimenter brendan and when it comes to cooking mm. sounds good mate do you do the cooking for the fam yeah uh, well the Slow cookers are the easiest thing in the world. Mm, you do make so, it. And right. everyone loves it. So, yeah, I, I make my own bone broth, which is basically my stock, and I just throw it all in the morning. And I've, I, I, have a, I have a tech-free Tuesday, which all the family that are close to me come over, so there's no phone. So mm. we have a, a meal every Tuesday. That's in the human connection side of things. And, um, yeah, it's always slow cooked. Always slow cooked, so that's because I'm lazy, mate. Well, I don't know, mate. Some would say smart. We love our smart, our slow cooker as well. Don't, uh, yeah, be, probably the best thing in our kitchen, I would say. <laughs> mate, let's talk about. Let's go to emotional because that's one you referred to earlier. So, you know, give us a bit of a summary again on the emotional side, the how we feel, and some of the things that uh, impact our emotional state. Well, again, we're in a feeling state all the time, and that that our emotional response to things is, has one of the biggest. So we, we, we hear about cortisol, right? We hear about the negative effects of cortisol. We, you know, we hear about it, adrenal fatigue. Yeah. You hear about that constantly. Well, that's our emotional response to situations is that we, it's perceived threat most of the time. Very, very, and cortisol and, and adrenaline, by the way, are fantastic because in real threat, all right, that they are exactly what we need, but they're for a short term. Mm. They give us the energy and the focus that we require to deal with a situation. The biggest and what used to happen was real threat, so trauma or, or infection, used used to be the biggest impactor on human health. It's not anymore. Perceived threat is so our perception of threat. So, you know, the medical terms for remembered threat is depression. And imagine threats, anxiety, and what happens is that we're starting to see all the me these things that we call mental health, right? Which is kind of emotional health, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. is, is that the impacts of of uh, you know excreting adrenaline all the time because we perceive threat or we remember threat or cortisol th that starts to break our body down. Yeah, you know, so we need to understand that's the bad news again. Sorry, Brendan, again I I give the bad, but there's a good news to this. Okay, is that if if you can imagine or remember great things, things like oxytocin and serotonin are then excreted in our body, and these things, you know, enhance our digestive system. Okay, they they help our liver function. That they 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 again have an impact on our, our ability and our clarity of thinking over over a sustained period. So. But we have an issue with remembering great things or walking. You know, it's not a matter of being in a state of love and joy all day because mm. you don't go to the gym all day, do you? No. Yeah. You go to the gym and that it's actually rough. helps you elevate your your physical capacities. If you can do practices around imagining or remembering real joy or really looking for the opportunity to be elated during the day, they'll show themselves. Mm. Yeah, you know, that doesn't mean challenge isn't going to come into your life. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get the shits occasionally. It's you know that'll happen to you. That's a part of you know the human experience. But the more that you can practice those positive emotions, there's a whole massive impact on us hormonally. You feel better. 
So don't, don't you think that's your body trying to tell you something? Mm. Keep doing it, man, mm. if you feel better. Now, I always use the analogy, what do you do if you're walking down the street and you've got a stone in your shoe? What do you do? Stop. What do you do? Stop. Take Stop. the shoe, get it out. Yeah, because that's your body going, <clears throat> Brendan, Brendan, I'm sending you a bit of physical pain here, mate, because this rock's down here. If you ignore it, your body goes, well, that didn't work. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll rip a bit of skin off and increase the pain and that'll get his attention. If you keep ignoring it, you know, you're eventually going to have to chop your toe off, right? Okay, well, our body does the same thing emotionally. We'll have a we'll have an experience where your body will go, you'll get a little bit frustrated with something and that's your body going, hey, you don't feel right here, so pay attention. But what we do is we stuff it down, we ignore it. So your body goes, wow. Oh, well, that didn't work. Instead of being frustrated, let's just make him really annoyed and you ignore it again. So that goes to anger, then to rage and, you know, so we, we don't pay attention to our emotional state because we were, well, I was certainly conditioned out of paying attention to yourself, you know, mm. toughen up and have a cup of concrete, mate. Mm. And so our emotional state has a huge impact on all our behaviours. Yeah, you know, and it's it's something that you need to pay attention to how you feel. How, how why am I feeling this way? Awareness. How do how do you become more aware of your emotional state? Well, the same way if you and I are walking down the street, you know, how you going, mate? Why? You know, how often do you ask yourself that question? How much expertise do you have in yourself? Because when you ask yourself the question consistently enough, you can't lie to yourself. You can try. I've done that. You can try to do that. How am I going? I'm just feeling not at ease. I'm, I'm feeling annoyed. Why? Look, 90% of the time you'll have the right answer. I always say if you don't have the right answer, go and, you know, I have mentors or ask someone you trust, like I'm feeling this way. And if they don't have the answer, That'll be the next 5%. The other 5%, go and ask a professional about it. Mm -hmm. But ask yourself first. Become an expert in yourself. Are you worth two minutes a day, every day, Brendan, of just going to yourself, how am I going, mate? Why? I'm going great. I'm going really good. Why, why are you going good? Well, because I'm doing, you know, I got to do this podcast today. It was really cool. Keep doing it. Keep doing it, mate. How am I going? I'm going, no, I'm not so good. Mm -hmm. Why? And then you, if you can continue, to, I'm not saying that's the answer to everything, yep. but it, it builds self-awareness. And from that self-awareness, we, we become aware of the state that we're in and where we want to be. So then we can work out, well, I'm feeling this way. I want to feel this way. How do I get from here to there? And I'm telling you, 90% of the time, you have the answer. It'd be boring if you had the answer 100% of the time, trust me, because then we wouldn't go to someone and go, hey, Brendan, I need a hand with this, mate. Fair point. For me, for a man in the know about this stuff, why were you lying to yourself? Because I'm human. <laughs> and I was, you know, look, the biggest the, the biggest impactor on our, our behaviour is our subconscious conditioning. So, and that all happened when we were kids. So you believed in Santa Claus, right? I did for a time. Yeah, the tooth fairy. Well, you, he, that's the right answer. You did for a time. But you had Santa Claus conditioned out of your subconscious conditioning, right? He's not real. What? Are you kidding me? No, it's not. Yeah, he's definitely real. There's eating carrots. He drops a whole lot of presents under the tree. Definitely real. But you have it conditioned out of you, right? Is that mm. right? Mm. What haven't you had conditioned out of you between the ages of one and seven? Can I relate to something I can, when I read this part in the book that really resonated yeah. with me? Food. Yeah, I am, me too. I am a nightmare for I hate food wastage. So that paragraph that you wrote in that book, I'm like, wow, my dad, who's a great cook and I loved his food, he would – one of his throwaways lines was if he didn't finish your dinner. Didn't you like it? Why didn't you like it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, and that's subconscious conditioning. So mm. – you know, the subconscious, so why did I lie to myself? Well, because I didn't want to be an underachiever in a certain area. 
So I, I fib to myself. Mm. And, what you know, you can't give away what you don't have. So if you lie to yourself, guess what? You lie to other people mm. about things, about inadequacies, because it wasn't, when, the way that I was conditioned, not a, not consciously by my folks, by the way, but in, through through the school schooling, is is that if you didn't know something, don't admit to it, or <laughs> go sneak off and learn about it, or you know lie about it. Mm. And so that's what I did. And you know, I, I fibbed to myself about having things covered when I didn't. Mm. Mate, you're also a man who's spent a fair chunk of your life in, I guess I'd say, high-pressure environments around professional sport as a player uh, and a su- very successful coach. What did you do in those pressure environments to help yourself maintain that level of emotional stability, can I say? Yeah, again, it's it's before I do, because I do have some practices that I still do to this day, and I got so lucky you know, that, mm. I, that I stumbled. I read a book called Sacred Hoops. Um, oh goodness, his name just escaped me. The Lakers coach, um, Bulls coach. Um, it'll come back to me. So, um, but again, I, so I learned. He's the one that I know. No, not Bill Belichick, the oh. basketball coach. Um, oh, oh, oh yeah, I, the guy with the beard that in Jordan's time. Yes. Yeah, I know the guy. I can't oh, see his name either. Johnson. So it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Phil Jackson, sorry, Phil, my goodness, my goodness, please edit that out. Um, <laughs> Phil Jackson, I read a Phil Jackson book called Sacred Hoops and in 1995 and he got his team to meditate and I was super cynical at that time about that, but I read about it and I started looking at the results of it. So, again, I need scientific validation. It's a real weakness. I wish I'd, I, I wish I was more intuitive, but I, I'm not. That's the truth. I'm just not. Um, So I read about it. So I started using that for myself first. So I had a tool that uh, that allowed me to escape, you know, just on a daily basis. Mm. And I still use that. I've I've progressed that. I I, I use that with players. It was a bit um, unusual in 2009 and 10 when I first started doing it. So I've got a little bit of resistance to that. Um, But I use it every day now. Mm. And it's just a, a really simple thing. I don't know who made it spooky, by the way, meditation, because I don't know, like, again, physically you go in an ice bath, right, mm. uh, and that help you recover your body. For, you don't do it for an hour. You know, if you train for an hour, you do that for a short period of time. You recover for a short period of time. Well, that's what medita- my meditation practices allow me to do. This is that I just do it a couple of – sit there and don't think for five minutes. You know, I don't – you know, I don't need to sit on a mountain. You know, I don't need to burn incense when I do it. You know, it's 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 something that's a tool that works for me. But I have other friends that surf, mm. so they paddle out the back and and surf, and that's their form of, you know, how to, you know, their practices. So in the high pressure environment, it was off obviously a super efficient way of doing it. Mm. The issue is is that when you place other load on it, when you start having some personal things. That you know, praise you know, put pressure on top of that pressure that you've gone through. That's when you know you need to be very, very conscious about. Well, your normal practices aren't going to be quite enough. You need to you know need again seek clinical help. I really believe in an integrated approach um, in extreme periods because that's why why that's why those people have expertise. Mm-hmm. Otherwise. Why would you need a coach in for You know, like you've got most of it covered off you go. So in those high-pressure times, that's where I believe in modern times in particular because that scrutiny is elevated and the expectations are elevated, so that's where the pressure comes from is, is that in, in modern times, particularly coaches need that support even when they don't think they do. Yeah, I know, again, in your book, you refer to sort of a situation uh, around your first marriage and sort of coming home and still pumped up or whatever. 
I guess the million dollar question, just again, your view, your experience, what do we need to do better, uh, whether it's rugby league, whether it's just professional sport in general, but even thinking veteran affairs sort of stuff, that's pretty topical. We've got some friends in that space that, you know, there's all this heightened alertness all the time and they're on, you know, they're, they're pushing their bodies and, and high emotional states. But what do we need to do to, to do something different to help them transition sort of when they're off that? park or when they retire or whatever because there does seem to be some significant challenges ahead of us in that space yeah again what a great question brendan and I, can i use an analogy that i'm trying to remember where i, I pinched it from but remember i said i i um i, I have a good way of sharing it i don't or yeah you know, i, you I do, don't mate. come up with the knowledge you really do. Yeah. um look um what happens if you don't have a plan to cro- climb mount everest what happens well, if you tried climbing, you're probably going to die, I would say. What happens if you stay on top of Mount Everest? Uh, I think you'll die as well eventually. What happens if you don't have a plan to come off Mount Everest? You will die as well. Yeah, it's a repetitive one, eh? So yeah. many people like, like you know, high-level coaches, but, you know, a police who I've done a lot of work with, you know, military they learn how to climb Mount Everest and they learn how to stay on top of Mount Everest longer than the normal person. But <laughs> they don't get a plan to come off, off the mountain. And having a plan and a strategy to come off the mountain is crucial. Uh, if you don't, there's a consequence. Now, let me use ex-serving police that I work with. There was a strategy of coming off the mountain, which was 10 schooners. Um and that does, that's not sustainable, is it? Yeah. But you've got to think, If you, let's use the police as an example. They need to be hypervigilant at work, don't they? Absolutely. It, it, it is. You know, there's no amount of money you could offer me to do what they do for our community. My goodness. My respect for, after, after working with them in this space has grown. Mm. You know, they, they have to be cynical. Have you ever lied to a police officer? <laughs> if I Come did, on, mate. I have to say in, in my <laughs> teens, mate. <laughs> I have. And mate, so they, they get lied to every day. Yeah. So you've got to think they're hypervigilant yep. and they need to be cynical. Mm-hmm. Then they've got to go home to their families. <laughs> they've got to come off that mountain. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. having the tools to come off that mountain is absolutely vital in life for anyone who who has and again pressure is not something that is absent in modern life is it definitely not and you know we've added to it in recent times with the amount of change that we've had to experience in you know the pandemics and all sorts of weird weather that we're experiencing at the moment and i don't think that's going to go away in the short term so having a strategy your strategy This is about, again, that self-awareness that we spoke about earlier, but having your strategy to come off the mountain is crucial for you to have sustained performance. If you don't think you need to, there'll be a consequence to it. Mm. There there will be a consequence to it. So understanding how to balance that load in your life is essential, and we've lost balance in modern life severely. Mm. What about your strategy, Matt? What was your strategy? When did you start to develop your own strategy around moving from, you know, the coaching roles that you've had after, well, playing and to coaching and then doing what you do now? Yeah, again, not challenge-free, definitely. You know, I came out of coaching and I started doing one-on-one work with executives and and different people and and then I started the change room business and it, it it was really challenging. Um, and then going back into footy again and had some personal challenges uh, and uh, you're related to that. But but this time what I did have was those tools and understanding that, okay, how am I feeling? I'm feeling not great. What do I need to do? And you know, having those answers of I know for myself, I get in the ocean, you know, I do my meditation, I connect to people that I really care about, I show some vulnerability like, hey, Brendan, you got to, you know, I'm lucky I've got really great mentors where I can go to them and say, I need a hand because I have not got this covered. Mm-hmm. And you end up having a conversation and you realize that you did. Um, 
So just for me, that's that human connection side of things, having the, the right mentors in my life that I can I can have open and honest conversations with who I know aren't going to judge me, who I know, you know, I, I love these people. But again, showing that vulnerability, but also having those physical practices. I I know that <clears throat> I train all the time, and I don't real I don't even recognise the benefits of what I do physically until I stop. Mm. I meditate every day, and I don't I don't have a clue what it does for me until I stop doing it. I eat well. <laughs> and again, I'm, am I making sense here? Like we don't really realise because it just there's just those little one percent increments that improves our health that we don't actually realise it because we're hanging around ourselves the whole time that you are feeling better and then you stop doing it and you go, oh my goodness, I, know, I need to I need to get back in the gym. Or, you know, I, I need to get in the ocean or whatever it is. Yeah. It sounds like me to Matt to some extent, if I can sum up that, yes, there's some things that people can do around their emotional state, but fundamentally, if you as an individual are deliberate around improving, uh, maintaining a, a level of emotional state, then find something that helps you do that and that works for you. It doesn't have to be all this stuff that people list in books, do this, do this, do this. It's If that doesn't work for you, why would you do it? Find something that makes yeah. it feel good. And that is, you've nailed it. Mm. That's 100% accurate. So I've got a mate that loves fishing mm. and that's how he winds down. I I would rather, you know, run across broken glass than go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's his wind down. Mm. And he doesn't have to do it for f- five hours just gets there and you need, again, that come back to that self-awareness piece. You need to ask yourself the question, how is it I wind down? And you may, for some people who are watching this, they might not have the answer mm. to it, but you're better off coming up with the wrong answer than no answer because you, you'll go and do it and you go, no, nah, that didn't work. What is it that could be for me until you find it? And the other great thing about this is that, one, we're all different, Yeah. How boring it would, would it be if we we're all the same? But guess what? What winds you down when you were 20 won't wind you down when you're 30, won't wind you down when you're 40 or 50, mm. which makes life exciting. You know, it's, it, it's, you can look at it another way. You go, oh, my God, I just mastered this and now it's not working for me. That's one way of looking at it, but I'm not being positive. I'm being useful mm. here is, is that the useful way of looking at it is, is Oh, thank God I get, I get to try and, you know, find something else to do. Otherwise, oh, for me, anyway, I just think it would be boring as. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just chuckling to myself a little bit because I remember I was telling my wife, Tracy, about sort of your book and you and the interview coming up and stuff. And again, so many parts of the book were really resonated with me. But one of the things about humans, uh, we are bread to for variety especially when our eating and stuff like that and and she's like lo and behold some you finally listen to someone because i'm the sort of person that i would have you know the the kangaroo meats and i love all that sort of stuff but i'd do that every day for ages and then the doctor i'd do some checkups the doctor would say look you're having too much of this stuff and then i'd go and do you know the oats and fruit and stuff like that forever and she's like finally you're going to listen to someone <laughs> Well, again, it's so easy. I, I, my way of explaining is if I go to the gym and do arm curls, mm. okay, I'll get a benefit out. But if I do them every day, my body adapts and the, ma- the amount of benefit out of mm. doing that diminishes. You know, as much as we'd like to think we're in the modern world, we're not that different to how we were when we were living in huts and caves and whatever, mm. is, is that you got different fruit and veggies all year, right? You, you couldn't eat bananas all year, mm. okay? You didn't go out and catch the same beast that you went out and caught. Even if you lived on a river, you didn't catch the same type of fish. Yeah. So yeah. diet variation and life variation is what we're built for. That's that's why we're the most adaptable species on the planet. Mm. What, not only because we have consciousness, but we, we needed to because we're not the fastest, are we, or the strongest, so we needed to have that adaptation so we could survive. And guess what? 
not only do we survive, it's good for us. Mm. You could have the best plate of food in front of you, all right? That best, that this is the most nutrient dense plate of food ever. If you ate that every day, it'd be like that arm curl. Mm. Your body would adapt to it and the benefits of it would be diminished. <laughs> you know, we're, it's so much fun being a human. We just forget about it. And that word fun is so underutilized in high performance, is so underutilized in some, we're way too serious. Mm. We were, we we're equipped, you know, when we're kids, apparently we laugh about 400 times a day. By the time we're 30, we're down to under 40 times a day. Yeah, you know, I think we need to pay attention to kids a whole lot more because we're, we're meant to enjoy life. Mm. That doesn't mean it's easy, all right? That, But it does mean that, you know, we're allowed to laugh at things, you know, regardless of what they are. Yeah, absolutely. In regards to variety and fasting so in your book uh, it has changed something in my mind around fasting and being more deliberate about i mean we always ate before eight anyway but sometimes i'd have yeah. you know, a sneaky snack ice cream every now and again or whatever so can can i continue fasting between eight and eight Will that reduce benefits over time as well? Or is that something that sits outside of the, the box to, uh, around variety? Again, think of our genetic makeup. Think about your ancestors. So they got up in the morning and they probably went looking for food. And when they found food, okay, they brought it back for their siblings. And then they go looking for food again. So look, the, the variation around that without being, you know, people like this, they have certain windows that they eat in all the time. Mm. We're not designed to do that. So I don't often have breakfast, but how good is going out to breakfast on a weekend at a cafe with people that you love? Is love there that. anything better than that? So, and again, that comes into the human connection side of things that I, I, I'll, I'll just segue us into it. We will. Is, is that... You know, those, there's a thing called blue zones around the planet where they've done all this research, which is the highest concentration of centenarians, people over 100. There's six of them. And, they, you know, there was geeks like me that went over there and started doing research on them. And, yeah, they exercised, but it was what they call um, incidental exercise. So in Icaria in Greece, if I'm going to a friend's place, I walk up a hill, down a hill, up another hill, Okinawa in Japan, you know, they, they never stop working, mm. not because they have to, because it gives them purpose in life. Mm. So there's exercise. They eat well, but, you know, they have a durry and they like a wine and, you know, they do all that. But the biggest impactor on their well-being, on their hormonal state, is human connection, the time they spend with other people, you know, and that's what we're meant to do. We're meant to connect to other people. That doesn't mean some people like sitting in groups. Have you ever been to Greece at lunchtime? Not Greece, no. Well, um, Costa Rica or even there's people everywhere. Mm. You know, mm. we eat and eat on the way. Oh, it's really healthy. And then, no, you're meant to sit down mm. and enjoy meals, you know, with people that you care about. Again, it's not a matter of you talking. I certainly talk in that environment. You might have picked that up. Um, but some people just sit there. And it's that human connection. That's what they found is the biggest impactor on our health and well-being. These the biggest common denominator between these six areas around the world where people live to over 100 more than anyone else. And the concentration of 80 plus 80-year-olds 80 is higher than anywhere else mm -hmm. is human connection, is being around other people feeling at ease in other people's company, feeling safe in other people's company. And you have to think about it. It makes sense, right? I went back and talked about us in caves. If you are back in those days, if you are on your own, you are likely to end up food. But if you're around other people that you, you felt safe with, you know, you're likely to get food, yeah? Mm. So it's this is a, an instinctual, you know, premise that we have in our life of, of under, uh, how important that stuff is. is so you could be the fittest, you know, eat great food and move and breathe well, 
But if you're isolated, you won't be well. You've seen that person with the great rig that's miserable, right? Because mm. they separate themselves from ever other people. Such an important thing to have fun around because it's hard to have fun on your own mm. over a sustained period, yeah? Absolutely. In your experience, again, what impacts people? There are people out there that are better at maintaining, connecting with people and developing relationships and others. What impacts people's ability to create good connections and community, as you put it in your book? I'm going to be repetitious here. It's first of all, self-awareness. Now in our change room program, we have a, uh, an author and an international TED talker called Dr. Ali Walker. She's amazing. She talks about your connection type. But me understanding, okay, and th th it was me understanding that I'm a bit of a know-it-all, all right, and, and that allows me to stop saying I know to people and just sit back and – but understanding myself – stops me getting in the way of my connection type. So I like to connect with people. I like to swim at both ends of the pool, right? So I like to go deep and meaningful, talk about the meaning of life, but I like the shallow end of the pool as well. You know, I like sitting there talking about the footy and, and having a beer and or going to a cafe and telling really bad dad jokes with my daughters, right? Um, so I like both ends of the pool. But I also need, know I need to listen better. So that's a real, by having that self-awareness that, okay, it's good that you want to contribute, but try what our First Nations people used to do in Australia, deep listening. But if, and if I sat there and we were in a conversation and I was listening deeply to you, that makes you feel different. And you feeling different, we pick that up, okay? So just... You know, little tips like that about understanding yourself, like say, Matt, you need to shut up occasionally when you're in conversations and just listen to people and hear what they're saying rather than having your next, getting your next thing ready to say in your head about what's going on. That is my, my understanding of myself has built my ability to connect to other people. Mm. So it sounds like you've got that shrewd listening trait and it's not about changing that trait it's about what you do with the thought yeah but but you can only do that if you listen you know it's i mm. i i found a saying recently that i added to is is that you're, you're not teaching unless they're learning you're not teaching unless they're learning and i added to it is is that you're not learning unless you're listening so and I found a lot of times in conversations I was listening to myself come up with the next part of that conversation start instead of just be quiet in there and listen to what this person has to say. And I feel like that's really elevated my ability to connect to other people. Mm. I wish I learned it at 27 rather than 57, but, you know, you learn it when you learn it. Through your programs, Matt, in the change room and, you know, I, I watched a number of testimonies and, and fantastic and they support actually what you said earlier about, you know, Matt has an unbelievable ability to create uh, or move complex things into simple language and, you know, for able for people to, to get. How do you help people? There's no doubt they learn in the room and in the sessions you're doing. What can you do? What do you do to help them continue that learning, maintaining the stuff, the really good stuff that you're sharing with these people and helping them learn? Yeah, we're creatures of habit. <laughs> so one, certainly continued support through, you know, we have a we have an app and and things like that, which is which is great. Mm. But just teaching people how to develop routines in their life. And once, you know, what happens is that I always say that you get that initial stage and when things are just starting to get boring, it means they're nearly a habit. <laughs> just get through the boring part. Okay. And then all of a sudden you're doing it without, you know, without consciously having to think about, you know, certain things. So it's, 
it's giving them the understanding and the tools, the tools up. That's my big thing is giving people tools to create habits in their life that resonate with them. So we, again, we have eight foundations in our program and we've, you know, we're talking about four key ones there. Mm. Don't choose them all because they're all related. So, you know, whether it's developing emotional capacities or whether it's sleeping better or eating better, don't choose all all of them. Choose one because you know that if you eat better, for example, all right, you're probably more likely to have more energy, which will mean you exercise a little better and you probably sleep better based on the fact that you're exercising and then that, that cycle starts. There's a whole lot of breaking points. You've got to find yours. Just to split environments, so let's look in the corporate environment. I know you do a lot of work in that space through the change room. Have you noticed any regularity or any connection between weight and performance with people? Not not in the leadership side of things, not openly, no. Mm. However, I would say this is that and you know, in in the most delicate way possible is, is that if you can show people that you're looking after yourself, and that doesn't mean showing up, you know, looking after yourself is a personal thing. This is not about walking around and having your abs flying out of your body, okay? Exercise and health is about, about you. Mm. But if you can, and, and you can tell when someone's looking after themselves, and that actually elevates their ability to lead, in my opinion, mm. is that because if they're leading themselves, it means that they they're equipped to lead you. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, they're a marathon runner or anything like that. As I said, it just means that they yeah. So that's my own assumption around it. I don't know that to be a fact. Mm. You know, I, I just feel like that in that leadership space, that would be one thing. But again, what we try and do to lead is if they're not in the best, you know, best shape or that they, they feel like they can be physically or mentally or emotionally better is why don't you go and ask the people that are in your charge how they can help you? Because showing that vulnerability, oh, Goodness, I wish I again learnt that ages ago as a head coach by going, look, I don't really know. Can you give me a hand with this? Because I, I really value your opinion on this or, you know, how I do this better. That immediately makes people feel safe. It engages them in the the purpose that you've got for everyone in the room. Yeah, so that sort of stuff, I again, I think I really encourage these days with the people that we have in our leadership programs. Mm-hmm. Just to wrap up community, mate, and that interacting with people, what would you suggest to anybody listening to do to enhance their ability to interact? Really quickly again, understand yourself. Awesome. Understand yourself. How, how are you at your best when you're around other people? And what are the things that if, you know that voice you have in your head when you're driving in your car that just doesn't shut up? Yeah, sometimes I feel like Paul over and saying, mate, you need to get out. You drive me crazy. You know, be again, have that self-awareness to go, what what am I really good at in conversations and human connection? And what are the things I'm not so good at? And then just get a little bit better at the things that you are good at. And then again, as I did, I like I learned probably five years ago to say, I don't know. It was the greatest gift in human connection I've had ever. I don't know. Wow. Why, why couldn't I say that my whole life? So just things like that of understanding myself better it makes me easier to be around. What do you think stopped you from saying that earlier? My conditioning. Mm. Again, my, I was a head coach, so I thought my job was to know. So even if I didn't know, I'd say I know <laughs> and then go away and then try and find the answer. And what I didn't realise, again, maybe through, again, 
leadership's changed and evolved as, as like young people have. Thank goodness. That's, you know, people talk about, oh, young people today. I know that's what was said about me when I was a young person. Thank goodness we're evolving. So we just, again, but the way the leadership that I was taught is you need to know. It's your job to know because you're, you're, you're in charge of these young people. And, and that, that, that was my conditioning. I didn't know any better. Mm. Um, but now I, I can just see myself saying to some of the amazing young athletes I had, on the, I need a hand here. You need, you need to tell me what, what is the best way for us to advance in the right direction. Now, that if you could do that, not half the time, but, you know, as a leader, if you could do that 30% of the time, you know, it, 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 you'd be amazed mm. in the impact that it has on your teams. Let's move to the fourth foundation that we're talking about today of the four mental, how we think. How important is this, how we think? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, you know, apparently we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day and I'm not encountering too many people have an issue with underthinking. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it tends to be, it, you know, it's it, so our biggest issue with thinking in modern life, I, I really believe, is, is that we, we're doing way too much of it. And we overthink things, and we're fully. You know, we just remember that bit I talk, We talked about loading and then recovering. Mm. We're not doing the recovery piece in the mental area very well at all. So we're thinking, and then we're looking at our phones and thinking more, and then we watch TV and we think some more, and then just before bed we're looking at our phones again and we're thinking. And we get up in the morning and we're thinking, and so we're having this co continual mental stimulation mm -hmm. that didn't exist. You know, again when I was a kid. You know, you, you, this wasn't prevalent. You didn't have to think all the time. You weren't taking in information all the time. And we're not designed to do that. So I think for me, the biggest impact is on what we call mental health, this overthinking, this overanalysis of everything, just requires us to have the ability to switch off. I don't think there's too much... There is some bad information around, and you know, in, <laughs> these days. But I don't think there's too much, too much of it. It's just that that we're we're just trying to process way, way, way too much. And there's a consequence to that. You overthink constantly without recovering, just like if you overtrain without recovering. There's a consequence. There's no escaping that. It does, it's not a matter of, well, I can handle it. No, there's no escaping it. There'll be a consequence to you and it all manifests in different ways, right? So someone will get like physically get high blood pressure and there was, there's a whole lot of different consequences. Some people will get a heart condition based on that. Some people will get, you know, other circuitry issues related to it. The overthinking side of things is the same thing, is, is that some people will just shut down. They'll get. They'll just hit a point where their, you know, their body, their mind will say to them, "No, nah, no more. You're shutting down." Some people with, will withdraw into themselves. Other people, you know, will just start blithering stuff that makes no sense. Eventually, if you don't learn to switch off, there'll be a consequence. If you're in a a group and you know friendships that you've known people for a long time. Are there some early signs around overthinking? I'd imagine there is. I'd, I'd have to say that that um, I'm probably not the best one to answer that. Mm. You know, I've, the the reason being is, is that you know, I feel comfortable talking about areas where I have the most expertise in the overthinking side of things. Yeah, look, let's not overthink it. <laughs> let's just do what we talked about. Brendan, you're not yourself, mate. Mm. And if someone you love or someone close to you or a close friend of yours you says that to you, pay attention. That would be my advice mm. because you know, that, they're the people that pick it up. Now, the first person to pick it up, if you're not paying attention to yourself overthinking and you're not having that self-awareness that we keep coming back to, 
I'd be pretty sure that your wife would be the first one to say, what's going on? And then, you know, your family or, you know, a really close friend will go, just don't seem to be yourself. That's when you need to pay attention. Now, the tools to under or to stop thinking so much, you know, again, I use meditation. That's my way, escape of doing it. It tends to handle both the emotional and mental side of things. But again, you've got, all of us have got their, our own way of, some people use that mindfulness. My sister loves, do the colouring in. I've got daughters that paint, do, do, do painting, and that's how they switch off. We've all got our own ways. Yeah, great example. And I think, again, using, I guess, your traits around analogies, it's almost like the, the mind, you don't want the mind to be a marathon. You want it more to be a sprint and make sure we're getting adequate rest between those sprints. Is that fair to say? Yeah, but again, some people have a, have roles in life that it is a marathon. Mm. Yeah, there's no escaping it for them, you know. And sometimes in the coaching realm, it's a marathon. You know, you because you have short weeks and you have long weeks, and sometimes there's no days off, and they're long hours, so it's a marathon. But in that marathon, you know when to stop and have a drink. You need you need, and we're amazing creatures. You know, like if I'm thinking for five hours, it doesn't mean I need to stop thinking for five hours. If we just give our brain a rest for five to ten minutes, it's it's incredible what it gives it the opportunity to do. So just look, how do you switch off? What is your way of switching off? And, and pay attention to that. And don't say, yeah, I know. I know how to do it. No, do it. Because if you don't, again, come back to that, what I said before, there's a consequence to it. And at the moment, I'm not enjoying the consequences I'm seeing, you know, as outcomes of people overthinking. What works for you in that mental rest space? Um, meditation, definitely. I do that. I have a thing called Keely meditation. I do it twice a day. It's only five minutes long. Journaling. It's amazing what comes out of you. It's not where well, when you journal, it's not even about what you're thinking. <laughs> it's just it's what comes out of you that that's really interesting. Mm. And just spending time with friends, laughing. Um, they're, 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 they're my key ones. You know, definitely just when you, when you feel your shoulders drop, right? Because yeah, tension tends to travel travel this way, right? Emotions travel that way. You know, ah, you know, we've all done that, both good and bad. But then, you know how your shoulders go up and some people clench their jaw and some people go like this. That's Well, tension travels the opposite direction to emotions. Mm -hmm. You know when you're in a safe situation with friends where you can let all that thinking go because you feel, I feel my shoulders, for me it's my shoulders go up. I feel my shoulders drop. You know, and I feel that's when I go, oh, I didn't even realise I was tense. But then I sit down with people that where I don't have to think, I'm just hanging out, I'm not going to be judged by anyone, I'm going to have a good time, I'm going to have a laugh, you know, a coffee, a couple of beers or whatever it is. That's, that's for me, that's my switch off. Hmm. In your book again, I think it was from the age of about 30, we lose X number of brain cells per year and i did the calculation and i'm up to about 50 million brain cells uh, which is a worry but you also flip the coin and start talking about the infinite opportunity to um, grow you know redevelop neuro pathways that sort of stuff how can we as we age you know continue to develop improve our mental capacity yeah, it's really interesting isn't it that's so that's true we, i think we once we get to that 30 years of age, we it, it, and obviously it goes in different angles depending on our lifestyle, okay? So mm -hmm. if, you know, if I want to drink every day and eat badly, the, the amount of brain cells I'll lose every day will will obviously the, the slide downwards will, will increase. Mm -hmm. And there's things like nootropics that you can take that will decrease the speed of, of you know the diminishing brain cells but mm. you're not going to stop it but the neural pathways between cells is inf is infinite how do we how do we do that learning learn one new thing a day 
doesn't need to be quantum physics or rocket science. Just learn one new thing a day. You know, and you know, what that does is that creates new neural pathways. And it's really interesting when you look at it because it's, again, I'm a bit, again, science geek in this area and I don't want to go too deeply into it, but you can see that you can stop neural pathways or bad habits and creating new habits, you create new new neural pathways. And it's the way it pinches off and then grows into different directions is so fascinating. It just we're we're amazing creatures. So you need to use that that phenomenal part of us that you can what what when do you have to stop learning? Have a look at all the have you met someone who's over a hundred and really healthy? Uh, unfortunately not. When you do, and I suggest go and find someone, even if they're in their 80s, who is, who's really healthy, mm. they're learning all the time. But they've certainly got a lot of wisdom to share and they're normally not too scared of doing that. They're really confident people, but they're, they're always inquisitive. Mm. They're always curious about you. They want to learn more about you and why. And it's so interesting. And so I've probably met five or six people over 100, but a lot in their 90s. And the really healthy ones are so curious. They want to know everything about you. They just ask you questions repeatedly because they want to learn. And by doing that, they're creating new neural pathways. Mm. So they've got way less brain cells than me, but far smarter than me. Work that out. Well, mate, the way you're going with all this stuff and the, and the learning you're doing and the development in this space, you'll probably get to 150 or so. <laughs> There's a guy called Dave Asprey. He's a really, he's a, what they call a biohacker. He invented a thing called uh, Bulletproof Coffee, which is oh, butter yeah. coffee. But he's into, he's into all that. Um, look, I'm not in, longevity is not my thing. You know, I, again, I, I'm so lucky I got to hang around people like Deepak Chopra through a guy who is a publisher of Hay House Australia, a guy called Leon Maxson, and met Wayne Dyer and oh, so many amazing people. And I guess what you learn from those really, really smart people, it's not about how long you live, it's, it's how you live. Because we're human beings, right? So it's about who you're being, not what you're doing. Um, and just enjoying whatever time frame it is that you've got, enjoying every as much of it as you can. Not all of it's going to be enjoyable. That's the, <laughs> otherwise, you're not a human. You've, you've arrived on the spaceship, you know. The, the, but enjoy what you can. Mm. And there's plenty of opportunities to enjoy life. There is, there's heaps of them. Matt, you've mentioned a, a few names there. So now I think it's appropriate for me to ask you who or what has had the greatest impact on your own leadership journey? Oh, yeah. I, I thought about this one because everyone has to a degree. Everyone that's I've been led by or I've seen as leaders, you, you te we tend to learn by contrast. So we know what fast is because we know what slow is. We're hot and cold, right? So some leaders taught me what not to do and some leaders taught me what it was to do. But I, I had a guy called Paul Singer who I worked for as a recreation officer when I was in local government at Dremoyne Council. And I guess Paul really, he was, again, when I reflect back, he, he didn't, I didn't realise at the time, by the way, but when I reflect back through all the amazing people I've been exposed to, Paul was probably the, the person that empowered me the most to believe in myself. He was the one that showed that vulnerability as a leader that I talked about earlier about uh, you need to work that one out yourself, man. I haven't really got that covered. So he, sh he showed a belief in me that I could work it out. So I felt safe in his environment. You know, I knew the purpose that he had. You know, we were in a community services environment. I knew he had the purpose of serving people. And that really resonated with me. So not in a, we didn't sit down and have leadership meetings with him or anything like that. He just made me feel safe. He made me feel empowered and he made me enjoy what I did, not by saying go away and enjoy this, but by the environment that he created. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I always look back that on that 
that little period of my life, I only worked with him for probably 18 months, two years. I look back on that and just think, wow, I wish I took a lot more of what Paul taught me than, you know, some other people. But, you know, I had guys like Brian Smith that I worked under that were so smart and, you know, taught me how to structure being a head coach. But it was the things that I I forgot rather than what I needed to learn that, that, that perhaps got in my way. Matt, I normally close up there, but what I thought would be a great idea is chapter seven of your book, Pint Glasses for Asses. <laughs> to close out, do you mind sharing that story? Because I think it is just so relevant to what you're about and everything we've spoken about today. I guess the thing about it, was, first of all, I'll, I'll give you the theme first. It's about balance in life. And I was coaching, it, this was in the year 2000, and we won a Challenge Cup at Bradford. And it, Challenge Cup at that time was right in the middle of the season because they moved from winter to summer. The Challenge Cup was it was such a major event. And we won the Challenge Cup, and it was an amazing experience. Just still hard to explain. Um, because Challenge Cup is a little bit like the Melbourne Cup in Australia. When everyone becomes a horse racing expert, right? Well, everyone in the UK all of a sudden is engaged with rugby league, a sport that's not a big sport there. And, you know, you get 90,000 people show up at the ground. Anyway, we won the Challenge Cup and I took them away to give them some opportunity to enjoy it, even though it was in the middle of the season. Um, but there was so much momentum on that enjoyment that that <laughs> the partying kept going and I could see that it was impacting our performance levels. So I um, I got one day, and I was probably a little bit cranky every now and then. you got to understand, I started coaching when I was 32, so I was a pretty young head coach. So at that stage, I think I was, yeah, about 35, 36, and I bought in, three pint glasses, and I said to them, I go, this is your family pint glass, this is your professional pint glass, you as a footy player, and this is your social pint glass. And I explained to them, I started filling them up, and I said, like, if if you get your professional pint glass and you overfill it, it will impact your family life and your social life, and eventually your football life will be impacted by that. So, and then I said to them, then if some of you have had kids for the first time this year, and I could see that you filled, you overfilled your family glass and that's impacted your social and your footy life. And eventually if you keep doing, you don't get that balance back, it'll, um, there's a lot of swear words that went with this, by the way, but that I won't share. And then for the I basically too. had two pints and I said, I want to show you what's going on at the moment. So I just filled up the social pint glass until there was beer flying all over the floor and all that sort of stuff. So I said, that's where we are at the moment is, is that our social pint glass is overfilled and your families are suffering. I know that because your wives are contacting me and your, your, you know, your mums and dads are contacting me. And I can tell you for a fact that our professional life is being impacted by this as well. So it was weird that I, I've never really progress past that theme, Brendan, of how important balance in life is. Um, I just, I probably, I t and you know what, the funny thing about that story is, is I still have players that from the UK always share that story with me, slightly different and was, and again, it always sounds better with York, Yorkshire vernacular, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, so that, that my accurate. thing for everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My thing for everyone is is that, you know, find your balance in life. It's it's so important. You know, in that you know, in th that time it was professional, family and social. Now it's probably a little different in life. It's how we integrate because remember we used to have work-life balance. <laughs> you know, well, there was family work-life balance when I grew up and then it was work-life balance and then it was work-life integration. Well, now we're just at life balance. Mm. Yeah, because you know, in the pandemic, people were getting out of their bed, walking two meters, and they were in their office. You know, and sitting here doing what you and I are doing now, 
and we lost balance. So we, you've got to, again, fill those pint glasses up you know, to the right level. Drink one of them, that's for sure. Nothing like a good pint of uh, Northern Ale, but, um, uh, yeah, finding balance in life is, is again, a, a key theme of what I like to share with people. Mm. Matt, there's <laughs> so many aspects to leadership. We, we know that. But some of the key things that I believe around, you know, effective messaging, which is the story you've just shared and people remembering that sort of stuff, leading yourself and that ability to improve ourselves and mastery. Again, you're, you're living and breathing that. And um, obviously your ability to connect with people uh, has been pretty first class over a long period of time because you've got results from high level people achieve high level things in high level organization environments. So mate, well done on what you're doing. You've helped my neural pathways today because I've learned a lot. Your books help my neural pathways a lot. It's been a pleasure connecting with you, mate, and an absolute pleasure having you as a guest on the Culture of Things podcast. Yeah, thanks very much, Brendan. And to all your listeners, you, again, if you need anything, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, and if you have a read of the book, I hope your feedback would be highly valued. Thank you, mate. If you can't lead yourself, how are you going to lead other people? Looking after yourself across the physical, mental, emotional, community and spiritual areas is foundational to your credibility as a leader. Physical health is the one you can't hide from. In my experience, this is a sign of mental weakness and ill discipline in a leader. If you're leading people and encouraging them to have mental strength and discipline in their work, do you think they'll take you seriously? As a leader, take a good hard look at yourself. Are your actions congruent with the actions you expect of others? If not, will you be vulnerable enough to enter the change room? These were my three key takeaways from my conversation with Matt. My first key takeaway, leaders lead themselves first. Do you remember what's said in the safety briefing on a plane? Fit your own mask before helping others. Take the right actions across your physical, mental, emotional, community and spiritual self. Be disciplined in these areas and lead yourself first. My second key takeaway, leaders understand the power of simple. Matt's superpower is turning difficult concepts into simple. He has the ability to process knowledge and make it accessible to people through simple messaging. This interview, along with his book, are great examples of his ability to simplify. Leaders understand the power of simple. My third key takeaway, leaders pay attention to their emotional state. We feel 24 seven, meaning we're in an emotional state all day, every day. It's the biggest driver behind how we think and how we act. Ask yourself, how do you feel regularly? Listen to your answer and make the changes to improve. Leaders always pay attention to their emotional state. So in summary, my three key takeaways were, leaders lead themselves first. Leaders understand the power of simple and leaders pay attention to their emotional state. What are your key takeaways from the interview? Let me know at theculturalthings.com on YouTube or via our socials. Thanks for joining me and remember, the best outcome is on the other side of a genuine conversation.